hello um, and greetings from uh, just on the edge of the temperate rainforest here on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples, uh, specifically the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Sarnex peoples. Uh, otherwise, this area is otherwise known as Southern Vancouver Island, just outside Victoria. Um, well, you can see behind me there, and the reason I'm starting this outside, despite having had to, having tried to record the whole thing outside a few times and being completely disrupted by um, animals and people and some traffic and tractors. <laughs> I'm trying to, thought I'd do some outside at least. So I'm going to start outside. What you can see behind me anyway is a, is a little grove of Gary Oak trees. Um, some of you will be aware that Gary Oaks are actually uh, an endangered um, ecosystem. Um, so I thought you might like to see that. I've been fortunate in any case to have been able to live here um, for a little bit more than five years now, having been invited here by the University of Victoria and not by the Lekwunga peoples. Um, so I'm very much aware that there's this really important and significant sense in which I'm an uninvited guest here. And having spoken to a number of my indigenous colleagues and friends about how I might be a good guest on these lands, despite having shown up unexpectedly, as it were. Um, one of the things that I've been advised by them over and over again is that feeling guilty about that isn't, isn't very helpful. Uh, but instead, I should try to behave in respectful and compassionate ways that might enable the people in the land to actually be glad that I'm here. I'm a good guest. So that's what I try to do. Um, I'm sure that I, I don't always and sometimes perhaps never succeed, but I try. I work here um, as a professor of philosophy, um, focusing mostly on East Asian traditions, um, and more recently also uh, as a Buddhist eco-chaplain running a really humble little service on the island um, called the Dharma of Trees. So this little paper presentation uh, tackles some academic issues as well as some living issues for me. Um, and I'd like to frame my talk then around a kind of concrete instance um, of, of something that has mattered to me in my work. So about a year ago this month, um, I think actually in yeah, it was July 2021, maybe the 12th of July, I found myself on the circulation list of an open petition from a largely Zen Buddhist group protesting plans in Northampton, Massachusetts to cut down some cherry trees in order to repave the street. Um, it was composed, this petition, uh, by Zen priests um, and signed off by a large group of very eminent Buddhist leaders of all kinds around North America. And the letter suggests, and I have part of the text here because it's a public document, um, in our Zen Buddhist tradition, we understand trees, mountains, rivers, and the whole of sentient life to be sacred teachers of spiritual wisdom. Culturally, cherry trees are particularly important as they are sacred expressions of spring and new life. The letter goes on to ask that the city authorities recognize that these trees are not yet ready to die which is evidenced by testimony from a certified arborist. And then it pleads that the city will reconsider the plan to kill these trees as they are healthy members of our religious community. To reinforce this at the invitation of local residents, the cherry trees were then ordained uh, by two Zen priests, which was witnessed by monks um, and members of the local community. So the trees then are healthy ordained members of our religious community. Now, I confess that I, I sat with this, uh, I sat with this uh, petition for quite a long time. Um, I immediately accepted and still accept, of course, the compassion and the good faith of its authors and signatories, um, is it, it strikes, it warms my heart. The petition seems to raise as well, kind of a range of complicated questions, at least for me, and at least partly because of the situation that I'm in and my constant awareness of being an uninvited settler 
here on these beautiful lands where I'm lucky enough to live and where I've tried to put down some roots. Hopefully the connections between these two, these two issues might become clear as we proceed. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time, if you'll indulge me with you today, unpacking some of these issues a little. Um, I think they gesture towards some really important contemporary challenges for us. First of all, um, the petition does seem to capture something important about um, Zen of the mountains and waters, to borrow that wonderful phrase made famous um, in Soto Zen, at least, by Dorgan's fascicle of the same name, and I'll return to that, that work in a little while. In the context of the theme of this particular conference, I know immediately that this phrase is not coined by Dorgan, um, but rather he draws the phrase um, from the already established Chinese term for the aesthetic um, of the living landscape in Taoism and Chan in Chinese history. But yes, let's say that a cherry tree can be a sacred teacher as suggested by these petitioners. I buy into this and certainly Dorgan will. Indeed, for Dorgan, anything and anyone can be a sacred teacher. So in his words, I'm gonna give you his words on this slide now. Uh, they're not his words. These are his words. Look to the trees and the rocks, the fields and the villages to expound Dharma. Ask pillars about the Dharma and investigate with walls. So, beautiful and romantic as they may be, it's not just cherry trees or even cherry trees in particular. Um, it could be a walnut tree, it could be a wall, it could even be the paving that may or may not get laid after those trees are gone. It's not just the natural fields, but the constructed villages too. So these lines from Dorgan are from the fascicle receiving the marrow by bowing, which is really concerned with how a dutiful Buddhist can and should cultivate the necessary humility, the necessary openness that opens, that allows them rather, um, to lower themselves before anything as a teacher. In fact, he's absolutely scathing about the idea that a teacher is someone or something with specific objective qualities, such as beauty or status or credentials. It's one of his pet peeves. Rather, a teacher is anything that we're able to learn from. And actually our ability to learn from them is determined by our dispositions, our humility, rather than by theirs, their qualities. So here's this kind of really intriguing Chan kind of question, by which I mean a question about Zen before it became so closely associated with Japanese aesthetics. Why stand up for those specific cherry trees rather than all the hundreds, thousands, and millions of trees that are being felled before their time every day? If we're gonna stand up for a specific tree as, a, as, as kind of what symbolically representative of all trees, why not the humblest, ugliest, gnarliest one we can find? since that is less likely to be a choice that we've made driven by our, our attraction to or our privileging of some kind of conception of beauty. So the petition suggests, I think, two answers. <laughs> this slide in the, that you're looking at now, I think, um, is a bit overkill <laughs> in, in, in illustrating them. But the petition, I think, suggest two answers. The first one is that cherry trees have this kind of particular and unusual cultural importance. Um, and this appears to be an appeal to the romance of the cherry tree in Japanese culture specifically, and probably not, at least not necessarily to the culture of Northampton, Massachusetts, which is the ancestral home, I think, um, of the Nipmuc and Pequot people. Um, so perhaps this Japanese culture this element of Japanese culture is at least partially extended into Massachusetts today by the presence of Zen Buddhism itself there, which Kwa Zen after Dogen conjures aspects of Japanese culture specifically. 
to some extent then this argument is effectively that cherry trees are important in Zen to the extent that Zen is an expression of Japanese culture. They have a kind of contingent importance as sakura, the unofficial national flower of Japan. And the second possible answer is something like this, that these specific cherry trees are simply much loved by the local population of Northampton, Massachusetts today, perhaps because they're so beautiful, perhaps because they've been there, I think, 30 years, um, and perhaps also because of a form of Orientalist romanticism, right, which could and probably would be a kind of background factor in, in the perception of this population of the beauty of the cherry tree. So in practice, I imagine the reasoning um, behind the petition was some combination of these things. My intention here is not to judge these reasons. I, I find them all to have weight. And I think that in itself is part of what's so um, fascinating and powerful about, about this instance. They all have weight. But what I want to do, I think, is to sort of tease these reasons apart a little bit to see how doing so might help us understand the meaning of this particular eco-Buddhist intervention and its distinctively Zen-like features. At this point, for instance, I see a few challenges emerging. I think there are three challenges emerging. The third one is kind of in two parts, but I'm gonna call it three. So first, it's not clear, and it's not clear to me that Dogen's Zen of the mountains and waters intends for practitioners to reify <clears throat> specific instances of the natural world but rather to awaken practitioners to the possibility that all things are sacred teachers if only we can perceive them correctly, where correctly means to, to perceive them with the true Dharma eye, the Shōpō again. Leaning rather more into Taoist recognition of the ugly, twisted, and everyday in that text, and, and Dogen cites Taoism often, um, and at least three or four times in that chapter alone. Um, Dogen's teaching appears more Chan than Zen in some senses, since it, it makes no use of the Japanese cultural romance of Sakura, which we see in at least um, later Western perceptions of Zen. In fact, Sakura doesn't even appear once, as far as I can see, in any of the uh, very voluminous pages of the Shobo Genzo. So second, notwithstanding this first point, it's plausible that the ostensible Japanese-ness of Zen, qua Zen rather than Chan, in modern and contemporary times encourages the privileging of cherry trees in particular as part of the romance of that culture. That is, the romance of the cherry blossom is a distinctive feature of Chan's identity as Zen today. My third point here, and I think this is the one that that bifurcates, I think we have two sub points here. The third is that this, this idea of privileging in itself raises some powerful issues for us, um, especially today, which I see moving in these two, these two directions. The first direction is a political and ethical question. Who is privileged enough to shape these contingent factors? That is which communities get to decide that it's the cherry tree rather than the white spruce in Massachusetts, for instance, or rather than the red cedar here in Canada, perhaps, that should be singled out as special. And the second direction, I think is even more profound. Um, it moves us towards this question of privileging hum human standpoints over the other than, or other than human or non-human standpoints. So I might gloss this question as something like this. Um, we might feel that ordaining a particular tree on whatsoever grounds we've selected that particular tree might be a good way to prevent it from being cut down. But does this act reflect something, um, does it reflect something like the kind of anthropocentric worldview out of which Dorgan was trying to break us? In other words, are humans really in a position to bestow empowerment and status on a tree? Is that the kind of humbling ourselves before something that is something that is always and already our teacher, 
that Dogen advised. And to be clear, I mean these questions really sincerely. I don't, they're not rhetorical questions. And I think the answers are deeply complicated, deeply complex, rather nuanced, and I think probably very personal for people. So having said that, I wanna take both of these directions in turn. I think I'm gonna treat and tackle them both if I, can take, if I can in the time I have left. So on the question of differential power and privilege between communities, I immediately have to confess right, that I'm speaking as a middle-class white European male living as a settler immigrant on the unceded territories of the Kwangan peoples here on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. This part of the world has had um, pretty much its fair share, more than its fair share, I think, of cherry tree related controversy, um, which and, and these inform my thoughts and feelings about this case. So I'm gonna show you a picture here. When I first moved um, to Victoria, I visited the city um, in April um, to find somewhere to live ahead of moving here from Europe um, later in that summer. And April, as you probably know, is cherry blossom season, at least for Japanese cherry trees. Having lived in Japan for quite a while, I felt really nostalgic um, and quite attracted to this profusion of cherry blossom in some parts of downtown Victoria. And this kind of lyrical beauty certainly influenced my choice of where to live. On a street, in fact, um, lined on both sides with cherry trees. Now, this image that I'm showing you is downtown Victoria. This isn't exactly the street uh, that I moved to, but it's pretty close. Um, not long after moving here, I became aware that some indigenous communities and ecology activists were petitioning to have all these cherry trees removed. Their line, as far as I understood it, was that cherry trees, which are not native, um, and in fact, these, there are some native cherry trees that would be the wild cherries, the American wild cherries, but these aren't those trees. These are Kwanzaa cherry trees, which are cultivars of the Japanese cherry. Um, these trees are um, seen by these groups as invasive, as non-native species that are damaging the ecological and spiritual environment. So let's say that again, damaging the ecological and spiritual environment. After all, many indigenous cultures, including some of those here, um, also see nature as a kind of sacred teacher. In short, cherries might be pretty. Uh, they might make middle-class European and uh, Asian settlers really happy. They might be good for property values in the area, but they're damaging on this view. They're damaging the land and the ancestral heritage of that land and the people. But it's not coincidental, probably, that the areas of Victoria with lots of cherry trees are also largely areas from which indigenous communities have been expelled um, into more distant areas outside of the town. And this began, you know, forcibly forcibly moved, forcibly relocated, and then later just pushed out by continuous gentrification of these areas. So if, if cherry trees are sacred teachers, they might not be the sacred teachers of these ancestral lands. Now, of course, there was powerful, powerful pushback against removing the trees, partly, because, partly by shopkeepers, uh, partly by homeowners who recognize the aesthetic and economic advantages of having these trees here, and partly by those who suggested that the cherry tree is culturally sacred in Japan. And then, of course, partly by taxpayers <laughs> who just didn't really know what all the fuss was about and just thought the trees were pretty, you know, they're pretty, why would we cut them down? So what a dilemma, right? What a dilemma. So my point here is not I don't want anyone to go away with this impression. My point is not that any of these stakeholders had illegitimate claims, rather the contrary, that there are this kind of wide range of legitimate interests um, and they just conflict. When it comes to the poor cherry trees themselves that center them for a second, that they've been planted in these Western streets on unceded indigenous land without any choice in this matter and partly probably because of Westerners romanticization of their symbolism somewhere else, in Japan, um, one can't help but feel, at least I can't help but feel compassion for the plight of these trees. 
even more tragic, I think, Kwanzan cherries are sterile. They're sterile cultivars. They're engineered by humans to produce more blossom for us to look at and no fruit to sow their seeds. So they cannot reproduce. And although they grow quickly, you know, they're fast growing trees, relatively fast growing trees, their root systems are really shallow. So they don't often connect properly with the vast underground kind of communities of plant and fungal life that we now know is, is down there. So in short, these poor trees are sterilized, isolated, involuntary strangers in a strange land facing death for being strangers. So it, it seems to me that Dorgan, in the spirit of that chapter, in that fascicle, would find a teacher in the complex suffering of the plight itself. If you're interested to know um, how the, I think, very skillful mayor of Victoria dealt with this, she decided that the trees would be removed, but that would not be removed, would not be removed, but that none of them would be replaced uh, with cherry trees after they eventually died in a natural way. So what's interesting here is what happens when we flip this around and contemplate the Kwanzan cherries in Northampton, Massachusetts, where the situation is clearly very different. What would it mean there to look to the trees and rocks and fields and villages to expand the Dharma? Now, to me, this sounds more like a koan than an intellectual puzzle. Perhaps the resolution then can't be a kind of reasoned argument, but rather it might be an action that feels compassionate to us, whomsoever we might turn out to be. I'm gonna share another slide here. So if that first question of privilege regards which human voices um, and preferences get prioritized, the second is really whether human voices should be prioritized at all. On this, there's an interesting debate around whether treating a tree like a fellow human um, and even ordaining it as a priest fails to recognize or respect the nature of the tree as a tree. Certainly for Dorgan, a tree is our teacher when we acknowledge its particular way of being and perceiving the world, not when we attribute to it a human outlook. There's lots to be said about this, but for today, and I don't think it's resolved. <clears throat> today, I just wanna draw out one thing that's especially pertinent. In the petition about the cherry trees in Massachusetts, the authors suggest that these trees are, quotes, not ready to die. That is, because they are healthy, they do not want to die. This sentiment is both affective and effective. I, I can readily imagine that these poor, sterile, isolated, alien cherry trees are clinging at least to, the, to their lives as something that they have in the world. Now, this immediately inspires my compassion. However, is the fear of death something that we can appropriately or even helpfully attribute to a cherry tree? Or perhaps is the absence of that fear actually one of the lessons that Dorgan might want us to learn from the tree as our teacher? Surely the tree is not caught up in human concerns and worries about our selfhood, our mortality, or, or our continuation. One recent lens through which we might view this, a little hop, skip, and jump into a contemporary uh, Zen Buddhist here, is that of Thich Nhat Hanh's commentary on the Heart Sutta. Now, of course, Nhat Hanh is, is not a Japanese, uh, is not in the Japanese Zen lineage, but rather in the Linji school of Chan, which became Tian in uh, Vietnam. One of the most moving passages in his delightful commentary, The Other Shore, sees Nhat Hanh literally look to the trees to expound the Dharma, to use Dogen's phrase. In fact, he asks a single leaf to be his teacher. It's about to fall from the tree, and that Han asks this leaf whether it is afraid to die. The leaf, qua leaf, answers very clearly, no. It tells that Han of its past when it worked really hard um, and helped to nourish the tree, thus sharing much of itself into the tree. And then it says, please do not think that I am just this form. 
because this leaf form is only a tiny part of me. I am the whole tree. I know that I'm already inside the tree. And when I go back to the soil, I will continue to nourish the tree. That is why I do not worry. As I drop from the branch and float down to the ground, I will wave to the tree and tell her, I will see you again very soon. Now, one of the lessons Nat Han learns from this leaf is that he should also not fear death because it is simply another form of continuation. The tree knows and embodies it, even if humans tend to live in denial of it. The lesson he learns here is not that he must attempt to help that tree keep all its leaves and fear their falling, but rather that he can die without fear. When Nat Han passed away um, in January of this year, very sadly, it would be wonderful to take him at his word right, regarding the lesson he learned from this leaf. And he says this, tomorrow I will continue to be, but you will have to be very attentive to see me. I will be a flower or a leaf. I will be in these forms and I will say hello to you. If you are attentive enough, you will recognize me. You may greet me and I will be very happy. So let's, let's flip this around again and see how this might help us understand the projection of a fear of death onto those poor cherry trees in Massachusetts who have lived and worked really hard to produce blossoms, to add beauty and life to the land and the communities in that area. If those trees are identified as sacred teachers by the petitioners, what is the lesson to be learned from them, them, the trees, and this complicated situation of suffering? What would it mean to treat those trees, even in this suffering, as our teachers? So let's wrap this up, because I know I'm a little bit over time. Um, and I want to wrap it up within the themes of the conference itself. So perhaps I might just offer this. The Zen ordination and petition to save the cherry trees in Northampton, Massachusetts last year captures so many important issues. Perhaps first and foremost, I believe it was driven genuinely and, and sincerely by the compassion of the priests, the signatories who recognized suffering and took action, took action inspired by that compassion to attempt to alleviate it. For me, at least, this attitude of compassion must be at the heart of Zen and Chan. And I think you can see it. This is, these are, you see Ruth Ozeki there on the, on the right, um, wrapping the tree. You can see the care and the love in this picture. I don't think it's ambiguous or in doubt. Looking a bit closer, the situation can teach us even more. In particular, we can recognize the touch of Orientalism here, and especially a form of Japanism in the perceived association between Zen and cherry trees in particular. While Dogen himself taught not to privilege any specific tree or, or grass or rock over any other, um, the contemporary association of Zen with Japan and Japan with Sakura shifts the affective significance of cherry trees in the Western mind. In this, we see the shadow of what Peter Sloterdijk and others have called euro Taoism, which is a kind of reductive, selective form of wishful romanticism in the West about the place of nature in Buddhism and in Taoism. When we look more closely, we find a much more complicated situation with so much more to teach us. In this case, what happens when we open to the suffering in both the people and the environment of indigenous cultures? which neither in Victoria nor Northampton necessarily prize ornamental Japanese cherries as ancestral, ancestral teachers, even if they might recognize nature as a kind of sacred teacher. At a time of understandably great attention to issues of decolonization, the time we're in now, if we do not look away from those issues, how does the koan of the cherry tree change for us today? And if we dig just a little bit more, 
and we offer compassion for the suffering of something that is other than human, how do we come alongside that suffering in its own terms rather than in ours? This, for me at least, is really the purpose of cultivating um, Dorgen Shorborgen, the true Dharma eye, being able to see the tree as a tree, to learn from it how the world is for a tree, rather than to project onto the tree how the world is for me. When we get this wrong, we risk slipping from compassion into its near enemy, into pity. So in the end, I think we're left with a, a genuine quan. The resolution of which seems to be to take action with compassion in our hearts, accepting that situations like these might not have rationally calculable correct answers. As one of the signatories of the peti petition, a, a beloved teacher said to me, I leave you with these words. In Zen, I cannot ever really know what will serve. I can only follow my heart, correct my course as needed, and offer love wherever I can.